your board chair, and I'll be presiding this evening. Uh, it is 6.31 p.m., and our meeting is in order. Our first order of business is uh, to rise with me and say the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States. Thank you. You may be seated. Chair would like to recognize a new alternate member, Sarah Dawn Pearlstein, City of Federal Heights. And I'm not sure if it's Pearlstein or Pearlstein. Apologize <laughs> if I got it wrong. Um, and now, um, Melinda, if you would be so kind to go through the roll call. That would be wonderful. Oh, all right, can you hear me now? Yeah, okay, perfect. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, Steve Odoricio, Adams County. <laughs> <laughs> From the hallway, I like the dedication. <laughs> all right. Jeff Baker, Arapahoe here, County. Here. Claire Levy, Boulder County. Ashley Stolzman, Boulder County. Austin Ward, Sitting County, Broomfield. Here. Randy Wheelock, Clear Creek County. George Marlin, Clear Creek County. Adam Paul, Sitting County of Denver. Kevin Flynn, Sitting County of Denver. George Teal, Douglas County. Abe Layden, Douglas County. Marie Mornis, Gilpin County. Andy Kerr, Jefferson County. <laughs> Lisa Ferre, Arvada. Here. Angela Lawson, Aurora. Here. Larry Vidham, Bennett. Here. David Spellman, Blackhawk. Nicole Spear, Boulder. Margot Ramson, Bomar. Greg Mills, Brighton. Here. Deborah Mulvey, Castle Pines. Here. Tim Dietz, Castle Rock. Jason Gray, Castle Rock. Tammy Mauer, Centennial. Here. Todd Williams, Central City. Randy Wheel, Cherry Hills Village. Happy to be here. Steve Douglas, Commerce City. Go CSU. <laughs> Michelle Rogers, Decono. Adam Moorhead, Decono. Steve Conklin, Edgewater. Here virtually. Wonderful. Thank you, Steve. Nathaniel Sierra, Inglewood. Tim Wright, Inglewood. Ari Harrison, Erie. <laughs> A lot of competition. Okay. Linda Montoya, Federal Heights. Sarah Dawn Perlstein, Federal Heights. <clears throat> Don Cognac, Firestone. David Whelan, Firestone. Josie Cockrell, Foxfield. Wendy Padilla, Frederick. Lynette Kelsey, Georgetown. Rachel Binkley, Glendale. Brian Deshare, Glendale. Paul Hazeman, Golden. George Lance, Greenwood Village. Dave Kerber, Greenwood Village. Chuck Harmon, Idaho Springs. Brian Wong, Lafayette. Jeslyn Sherzai, Lakewood. Stephen Barr, Littleton. Here. Gap Oh, excuse me, Kat Bristow, Lock Bowie. Jacqueline White, Lock Bowie. Wynn Shaw, Lone Tree. Present. Joan Peck, Longmont. Judy Kern, Louisville. Present. Holly Rogan, Lyons. Greg Edding, Lyons. Colleen Whitlow, Mead. Here. Paul Sutton, Morrison. Adam Way, Morrison. Tom Mahold, Nederland. Here. Richard Condo, North Glen. Here. John Dyack, Parker. Terrence Kelly, Sheridan. Neil Shaw, Superior. Justin Martinez, Thornton. Sarah Nermella, Westminster. Bud Starker, Wheat Ridge. Darius Pakbaz, CDOT. Sally Chafee, CDOT. Brian Welch, RTD. Right here. All right, and with that, Madam Chair, we do have a quorum. Thank you very much. Uh, just a point that uh, Steve Conklin, George Teal, and Holly Rogan had contacted us earlier today and have been approved to attend online. So, uh, show later, <laughs> since he was not there for roll call. Our next business in order is uh, uh, to approve the agenda. Do I have? Thank you very much. And a second. Those in favor of approving the agenda, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, say no. 
The ayes have it. Agenda is approved. Uh, chair has an announcement to provide. Uh, the Denver Regional Council of Governments has scheduled a public hearing for April 17, 2024 at 6.30 p.m. to receive comments on the 2024 amendments to the Metro Vision Plan and to the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan and associated air quality conformity determinations and greenhouse gas transportation report documents. The public hearing will be in a hybrid format at the Dr. Cog office, 1001 17th Street, Aspen Conference Room on the first floor, Denver, Colorado, 80202, and via Zoom. Further information about the public hearing is currently available on Dr. Cog's website and was available as of March 18th, 2024, the beginning of the public comment period. Next, we will have a report from the Performance Engagement Committee from its chair, Colleen Whitlow. Thank you, Madam Chair. We had two action items this evening. The first was to elect a vice chair, and congratulations to Director Speer from the City of Boulder for being the vice chair. Thank you, ma'am, very much. We appreciate it. Next, we approve the 2024 board retreat agenda, and ma'am, that is my report for the evening. Thank you very much, Director Whitlow. Next, we have the report of the Finance and Budget Committee. Thank you, Madam Mr. Chair. Uh, the Finance and Budget Committee, otherwise known as FNB Committee, <laughs> uh, met this evening. We had two action items. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Deb Mulvey, who was the prior uh, vice chair, and we elected uh, Director Paul Hessman to be our new vice chair. So uh, there you go. There he is. So uh, he's going to be the number two. And the other item of business is we approved an extension of the contract for Gravity Works, which is the vendor that provides uh, web services for Dr. Cog uh, through June 30th. That is all I have to report. Thank you very much, Director Kondo. Next, we have report of the Executive Director. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much. Good evening, everybody. It's great seeing you all. Uh, the first I'm going to mention is what Director Whitlow mentioned earlier, the board retreat. We, uh, we have an approved agenda, so we'll be getting that out to you tomorrow. We'll be sending out uh, an invitation, a formal invitation to you all, and I would strongly encourage you to RSVP as soon as possible. We, we're, we, uh, we want to make sure. And also, when you do RSVP, the one thing that I think is different this year is that if you only plan to attend the Saturday, so it's Friday, Saturday night, it's Friday night and Saturday all day, or until three, um, if you just plan to come Saturday, please indicate that on the, uh, on the invitation so that we can get proper counts for, for dinner on Friday night primarily. So. So thank you all so very much. And just as a, as a reminder, the event is on uh, April 26th and 27th at the Hyatt Centric, which is at the corner of 18th and Champa. You are more than welcome to park at, in this building um, because, um, boy, what was it? It was like $59, $59 parking at the, at the Hyatt Centric. It, it's, it's, uh, it's something. So anyway, so we're, we're excited. We're, we are excited about the agenda. We think it's, it's, it's really good. It's jam-packed for Saturday. Um, we will have a, have a keynote on, um, uh, on Friday night. Um, her name is Lisa White. Does that name ring a bell? Well, I guess it's a pretty common name, I guess, Lisa White. Um, but uh, she, um, she used to work at CML. She worked at CML for 12 plus years in kind of public relations or whatever. So those who have been kicking around the CML corridors for a while, you might recognize that name. But we're really excited to have her for that evening. So that's the board retreat. Hope you all can attend that. I think it'll be a lot of fun and, and uh, good information on Saturday. Uh, the next thing I wanted to mention to you is uh, a big congrats to Dr. Cox staff. We were we were notified earlier this week that we received um, uh, we received a grant, to, uh, the SMART grant. Are you familiar with it? It's a Strengthening Mobility and Revolutionizing Transportation Grant opportunity. 
Um, we will be receiving just under a million dollars, is $975,000 in funding Dr. Cox's Riot Alliance Human Services Trip Exchange Project. This is one that we've had, we've been trying to put together for quite some time, and for quite some time, and quite frankly, we just didn't have the resources to really make this thing work. So we're so appreciative of USDOT providing us this opportunity. Um, we will provide you all with a, you know, kind of a concept and presentation about this, and so you have an understanding of what it is. Um, but we're really excited to get going on this. So big, big shout out to staff for, for their successful application. And we will be bringing that to uh, F and B sometime soon to accept those funds. <laughs> Uh, Civic Academy, so the, for the new members of the board that don't know, Dr. Cog hosts a uh, Civic Academy. We do that uh, at least over the last several years. We do it twice a year, and uh, we have our, our solicitation is out right now accepting uh, participants in this, this, year, this uh, spring session. It starts on April 11th, and this really is a great opportunity for people to learn about the important regional issues and to learn of how they can get more involved in shaping their communities. So if you know of anybody that might you that you, you might think might be interested in something like this, please send them our way. Um, we'll be happy to uh, walk them through the application process and all that. But if they're if they uh, just want to go about it solo, they can get to the web, get to the application through our website. So um, yeah, and you know you, you might have those that you know that speak at your at, public, at your council meetings all, all the time that might like a little bit of a refresher, but the, the things that we do on a regional scale. So please, we would welcome all, all comers. And if you have any questions on that, please reach out to Sheila, Sheila Lynch or, or, or Steve Erickson on our staff. All right, uh, board retreat, now the annual award celebration. So that's scheduled for August 28th at the Sewell Ballroom, the same location we did it last year. The reason I mention this is because we have nominations are now open for multiple award categories. Uh, Metro Vision Awards uh, category honors projects, initiatives, and plans that help make life better in this region. Uh, also, the Way to Go Awards honors employers and commuters who promote eco-friendly commuter options. And last but certainly not least, our most prestigious award, the John V. Christensen Award, honors uh, uh, an individual who has been a regional champion for many years. And last year, of course, we honored former Dr. Cog board chair, uh, Herb Atchison. So um, please consider making uh, any nominations to any of those categories. We will be reaching out to your staffs as well to make sure that they understand that the, that the uh, applications are open and encouraging them to apply for projects that you all are doing in your communities, great work that you're doing. So, so, so please, uh, please encourage them to do so. And last but not, last but not least on the award celebration is, uh, you know, we're, we're, we, we try to do this event uh, strictly based on sponsorship uh, money, funding that we get. So we're, we're starting our solicitation as early as possible for this special event. So, you know, if you have any ties to corporate, nonprofit folks that you think might be interested in sponsoring, please let us know, and we'll we'll do the legwork. We just we just uh, looking to get it in a door. So, um, please just let us know. But we we're uh, we're real anxious to get going on the on the this sponsorship um, sponsorship stuff as early as possible. And with that, Madam Chair, I believe that's my report. It is. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> Next uh, business in order is public comment, and I'll check with Melinda to have anyone here public comment. Certainly, go right ahead. Thank you. And uh, I will mention that up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held for this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Uh, all right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it looks like our first and only speaker at the moment is labeled as Colorado Social Legislation. Um, I have unmuted you, and you are allowed to speak. Uh, actually, it's Randall Loeb. 
Oh, there we go. Hi, I Randall. Think you'd be more go familiar ahead. <laughs> with, with that name. I happen to chair that committee um, on public policy. What I am interested in speaking to you, and I'm sorry I'm not there, um, is the move to uh, house a thousand people temporarily and um, to do so um, in a whirlwind um, to count the numbers. Um, we work um, tirelessly to find places for people to live. And I'm 73 now, and I ride a bike every day. I'm a commuterist, and I work with the Environmental Protection Agency in a Source America contract with Bayot Enterprises, and I expect to work and ride for the rest of my life. I live as simply as possible. But for many of my brothers and sisters, just putting us into a temporary place uh, for those who work in the city and county of Denver, um, whether or not you call it a village or whatever it is, is not a sufficient way for us to, endure, to face and overcome the obstacles that more and more families are facing. And I've been speaking about this, as many of you know, who've known me for over 20 years. And I don't expect to retire, but I challenge us to find ways to make it possible for us to solve these problems together. And at the moment, I'm looking for a way to have an alternative, intentional community to live in for the rest of my life. I garden, I work with Metro Caring, and I work with um, Denver Urban Gardens. I grow food for the community, as well as work in many other areas having to do with public policy that I started out with. I'm always honored to participate in this. I was a member of the academy actually at one point and uh, in the Metro Vision planning years and years ago. Uh, but we need more options and we need to make sure people are safe. And that cannot be done without us putting our heads together across the region with MDHI, the Metro Denver Homeless Initiative, with all of the county support that we can muster from um, Laramie um, straight down to Pueblo. Thank you for your time and blessings. Thank you, Mr. Loeb, for your comments. Linda, is there anyone else here for public comment this evening? Is there anyone here in the room for public comment? Seeing none, we'll move to uh, close the uh, period for public comment. And um, our next uh, item of business is approval of the consent agenda which included the summary of the March 6, 24 meeting. There's such a motion. I have a question. I'm sorry. Certainly, yeah. Um, I had made a suggestion for a revision to the summary that was approved at the last at that special meeting, oh, and okay. I don't know if um, the revision, the revised summary, was what was approved. So in other words, uh, you had changes to the March 6th? Correct. And that was just to make a note in the record that um, both um, myself and the um, Chuck Harmon from Idaho Springs were not eligible to vote on the Front Range Rail um, issue. And it just needs to be noted that we didn't vote. So I, but I didn't know if I wasn't able to be at the meeting and neither was Chuck. So I didn't know if the revised version was what was approved or not. Um, just a question would be whether or not the packet, I, I know we didn't approve amendments okay. to that, but if the packet included your changes, it did not. It did not. So but the revised version. Let's do that. Let's catch this first, and then we'll catch the revisions to the uh, February meeting. Okay. Uh, so we had a motion and a second to uh, approve the um, consent agenda. And 
Uh, if there's no further discussion, those in favor say aye. Aye. And those opposed say no. The ayes have it, and consent agenda is approved. And now um, we are aware that the changes have been made to the February board meeting to cite that you and Chuck were not uh, eligible to vote and you did not place a vote in Correct. the Front Range Rail vote. Uh, so we would like to have a motion and a second to approve the amended uh, minutes from February, what was it, 21st. Thank you. Thank you very much. Moved and seconded. And those in favor of approving the, um, the amended minutes to the February 20, 21st meeting, say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it. And the amended version of those minutes are approved. Thank you very much for bringing that up. <laughs> um, next in our agenda is a strategic informational briefing uh, on the Colorado Freight Plan, uh, Coal Needer Planner, Transportation Planning and Operations. Uh, you have the floor. Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is Cole Nieder. I'm Dr. Cog's senior transit planner. I work on maintaining and updating our current freight plan, and I also participate in the statewide freight planning efforts on behalf of Dr. Cog, uh, which we are here to talk a little bit about today. Um, so over the past year, the CDOT Freight Safety and Mobility Branch has been conducting workshops, research, and outreach to update the Colorado statewide freight plan. They'll be presenting uh, today some key priorities drawn from that plan, um, how they align with state and federal goals, and then also how they conduct their overall planning process. So this update is timely because uh, we at Dr. Cog, Cog are also updating our own uh, multimodal freight plan. Uh, so keep that in mind as uh, CDOT goes through their own freight planning process and what you'd like to see in our freight plan going forward as well. Um, CDOT's the standard for freight planning in the state, and uh, we're lucky to, and it's great to hear uh, from them today. So I'll turn this over to Erica Denny, who's a freight planner for CDOT. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Cole. Good evening, everybody. My name is Erica Denny. I am the freight planner within the Freight Mobility and Safety Branch within CDOT. I've been in this role for just under a year. I actually come from the trucking industry. So while my background isn't necessarily planning, it is within freight. So when it comes to freight planning, uh, you, I at least have one side of the edge of the coin figured out. So really quick, so you know, this is a 325 some odd page document. And I'm gonna try and crank through it in 15 to 20 minutes. So it's gonna be very, very, very high level. I tried to bring in some of the Dr. Cog specific information to make it a little bit more relatable for this group in particular. But please, if you have questions, if I need to slow down, please just let me know as I work through this. All right. The freight plan purpose. So the freight plan is something that FHWA requires of every single state throughout the country to comply with in order to receive National Highway Freight Program dollars, which is a grant program that's supposed to go towards freight specific projects. So within CDOT, we had to take a kind of unique look at it. And, and please keep in mind, this is not a project specific document. This is more of a policy document making more of an overarching statement of how we want to try and strategize to hit a lot of these key, key items that the federal government requires us to do. So FHWA has 17 key items that we have to include within our freight plan. So that's kind of the number one priority for us as far as making sure that we can get approved so we can get the money is to hit those 17 items. From there, we focus on CDOT as well as the freight branch in particular's goals. 
And by doing that, we have a data-driven and stakeholder-informed process, as Cole mentioned, to try and make sure that we have as much of an input throughout the state to help with our freight program as a whole. It's kind of a summarized version, high level, of the very top is the kind of freight program goals, the national freight goals by the feds, and then Colorado's WIGs are wildly important goals. We think they do all intersect pretty well, uh, a lot of the same very generic kind of goals. So we're going to focus on some strategies that we looked at throughout this plan, being safety, security, mobility, maintenance, economic vitality, and sustainability and resiliency. So to start, I'm going to talk about the stakeholder process really quickly. So we did all of this within a year, which is pretty short when it all Come, is said and done. Sounds like a long time until you're working on it every single day and suddenly you're out of time going, oh my goodness. So that being said, I think we did a pretty darn good job trying to get out to the general public first off in different events, uh, trying to get in person, talking at different festivals, especially in the summer, be, making that one-on-one -on -one contact with the motoring public. We were able to hand out fact sheets as well as get out surveys both in English and in Spanish to make sure we can try and touch as much of our stakeholdership as possible throughout the state. We also coordinated with our Freight Advisory Council with our quarterly board and monthly executive meetings. Freight Advisory Council is full of stakeholders within the freight sector who step up and are willing to come in and hear what CDOT is working on and give their feedback. We also put together a working group that met a few different times throughout the year that was kind of more freight centralized to get an idea of what people want who may not be within the Freight Advisory Council. And we also hosted webinars for the general public to join in and listen in to the updates of the plan throughout the year. We also worked within regions and our, plan, our partners like Dr. Cog, MPOs, TPRs, et cetera, to try and again, get as much of a grand picture as we could from as many stakeholders as possible. Some of our outreach results, um, you know, we had over 100 conversations with people face to face, and we also had 380 responses to our survey online, which again, in a period of less than a year, when all said and done, we thought was pretty successful and we were pretty proud of it. Here within the Dr. Cog area, an example of what we went to was Sheridan Celebrates. Uh, that was on September 30th, and we were able to make contact with a number of people within this area. The survey responses to our joy was really successful covering all four corners of the state. It's a little bit easier to hit the Dr. Cog area. It's where we are, where we resonate, where there's a higher population, but we thought it was a great success to be able to get people to respond from all areas within Colorado because all areas need different things. So we were very happy about that. So to dive in on some of these strategies that we we're talking about, with the data-driven approach, we have a lot of different maps throughout the plan, and we want to try and have a way to look at them and have it make sense to what we're trying to do within this policy document. So this is an example zoomed in for the Dr. Cog region of crash hotspots, as in vehicle miles traveled and crash incidences. Uh, so you can see that the orange, or might look red up on the screen to you guys, is above 30 incidences per vehicle mile traveled. Blue is 15 to 30. Green is 5 to 15. Safety operations support and infrastructure. Examples of these are chain stations, weigh in motions, runaway truck ramps, pullouts, et cetera, and where those are within the Dr. Cog region. We're also looking at grade incidences. You've got trucks, you've got trains. The unfortunate reality is sometimes they don't play nicely together. So this kind of represents where those issues occur that we can try and look at and find ways to make solutions to avoid it in the future. Some of the strategies, there are a number of different safety strategies. This is a high priority for anyone and everyone, not just us and not just in CDOT. Um, but an example is the Mountain Rules Campaign. If this is something that you have not heard about, I highly recommend that you look it up or go onto our website, which I'm happy to provide if you wish. Uh, the Mountain Rules Campaign is a safety video series catered towards truck drivers. Fun fact, 92% of every truck that hits a runaway truck ramp within the state of Colorado is not from the state of Colorado. So we looked at it as how the heck do we get in front of these people? How do we interact with them? How do we help educate them without them feeling like the government is breathing down their neck? Because trust me, coming from industry, government's not exactly their top priority all the time. So by pushing out these videos, we gave them kind of just tips to how to cross through our state 
how to prepare for multiple major passes, how to prep for the winter months and chaining up, chaining down. We give a quick, a quick overview of how to chain. Um, you know, we've got, an, we've got a new video coming out here in the next couple of months on speeding. We're going to have the truck drive through Glenwood Canyon and give visuals and stuff like that for those that have not been exposed to our great state. So that's just an example of the safety strategies. Mobility. Mobility is a big deal for everybody. It kind of comes down to the, the bottom line for even you and I at a grocery store. We got to be able to get from A to B as a truck. The more efficiently they can move, the less it's going to cost them, which is the less it's going to cost all of us. So ATRI, American Transportation Research Institute, within the last month, has come out with the top 100 truck bottlenecks within the country. Colorado has four of them. All four are within the Dr. Cog area. Something that I don't think that's a shock to anybody. You can probably all list them off without even thinking too hard on it. So what we're trying to do is figure out what are creative ways to help mitigate, what are ways to try and help reduce that and make it better for all. Because at the end of the day, it's roughly estimated that $20.7 million are lost every single day due to congestion within the state of Colorado. And on the right-hand side, that graph shows that food and agriculture is the biggest hit as far as what the financial burden is. The mobility strategies, we've got a number of different things that we're trying to look at and plan to. Um, you know, a recent thing that we worked with was with the military on the PPP routing. Should we go into wartime and we have to deploy out of Fort Carson, how do they send their tanks? Where do they send their equipment? Keep in mind, these tanks are hundreds of thousands of pounds. So just driving over any, over, uh, any old bridge not the way this idea. So we worked with them to try and find the most efficient routing to get down to the port of Houston through our state. Maintenance, a number of different things we can look at with maintenance. Examples here are bridges, vertical clearance, um, as well as drivable life within our freight infrastructure. Maintenance strategies, uh, one of the things that we've been able to do thus far and plan to continue to do is timber bridge retrofit and replacements. So by doing this, we can go to these bridges that might be towards the end of their life cycle but aren't ready to be replaced, but maybe can't handle heavier oversized overweight loads. We come in and we've found ways to, at an inexpensive rate, put in girders and strengthening steel underneath these bridges to try and help not only elongate their lifetime, but also allow for these overweight trucks, which not only helps the economic side of it because it makes trucks more efficient, it helps with greenhouse gas emissions by cutting down the VMTs, it helps with our infrastructure by strengthening it and keeping it well maintained, et cetera. Economic vitality. This one is really interesting for me always, and especially within the Dr. Cog region. Being from the trucking industry, I've known most of my life that in Colorado is a consumer market. Always just something that I've known, but seeing it as numbers, seeing it like this, is really pretty interesting. And Dr. Cog in specific, you've got $136 billion worth of goods that come inbound and $81.6 billion outbound. So there's a pretty big difference there. But the really interesting part is that two-thirds of those of two-thirds of the entire state's commodity flows is in and out of the Dr. Cog area. A lot of that has to do with the distribution centers within the area. It has to do with the volume of, of individuals who live in the area, et cetera. But just a really cool thing to think about and wrap your head around that two-thirds of our entire state flows through this area. And then you see the Important supply chain highways on the right-hand side. You've got I-76, or yeah, 76, which is big, 70, which is big, I-25. The heaviest, the heaviest stretch of road within the state of Colorado is from Denver to Colorado Springs for trucks. In the distribution centers, between going back and forth with all the people that live within those areas, that's the heaviest volume corridor within our state. Economic vitality strategies. Uh, we, in the last few years, within the freight branch put together a Colorado Delivers campaign. It's another way we're trying to brand ourselves, just like the Mountain Rules campaign, just to get more people interested and intrigued in different ways. Colorado Delivers originally was a workforce development program that we put together to try and help reach out and talk to people who may not know what to do next within their careers and get them into CDL schools to get, with, get behind the wheel. 
I'm sure everybody here has heard about the driver shortage that we have nationwide. It's a global issue, not just within our country, not just within our state. But we spearheaded an effort to try and take that on and find ways to get in front of people who may not think about it. It was really successful working with industry partners, and we've handed off to Adams County, who've taken it and run with it. We plan to continue the Colorado Delivers image to try and help with educating the importance of supply chain, freight planning, our state infrastructure, et cetera. We're also looking at different ways for multi-modes to interact better, more efficiently together. You've got trucking, you've got rail, you've got pipeline, you've got air. How do we all work the most efficiently together? And how can we at CDOT try and help that? Sustainability and resiliency. You see our intermodal network within the Dr. Cog region on the left-hand side. Um, you've got different rails. You've got intermodal facilities. You've got DIA or DEN. Sorry, it's just my age of how long I've been here saying DIA. Um, <laughs> and on the right-hand side, you've got wild animal involved truck-related crash distribution. This is of the whole state and something that we really as a state should be proud of because while there might be what looks like a lot of little green dots of where trucks and animals have interacted, that's really not very many in the grand scheme of things. Compared to such as the Dakotas, this is nothing. So props to Colorado, props to CDOT, props to everybody here trying to make that a priority before the federal government even did. That was one of the 17 items they required us to include within this. Sustainability resiliency strategies. Of course, we've got the Colorado Clean Truck Strategy, which is something that we absolutely support and are there for them best we can in every way that we can. But that's also something for medium heavy duty trucks, it's gonna be a little bit longer to be able to enforce a higher percentage of ZEV vehicles. So we've always been trying to look at more creative ways to drop those emissions, to be more sustainable. An example is that timber bridge retrofit that I mentioned earlier. You cut off 160 miles off of a route that's run 20,000 times a year on a truck that runs on four miles to the gallon, that adds up pretty quickly. You don't need to do the math. Don't hurt your brain. Just know that that's a lot of emissions cutting out. So always trying to find that low-hanging fruit that we can affect today. We can affect within this four-year plan. We can do and make a difference while those bigger items are being worked on. Colorado Freight Investment Plan. Why we're doing all of this in general, Colorado FIP, Freight Investment Plan, is funded by the National Highway Freight Program. Again, this is the Fed's grant program for freight infrastructure. Since its birth, we've been able to put $179 million into Colorado's infrastructure for freight projects, and we're looking forward to being able to add more and more to that. We've been through a lot of these strategies, and we've tried to narrow it down into three buckets as our emphasis areas, that being truck safety, freight operations, and clean transportation. Truck safety, pretty self-explanatory. Get everybody home safe. I don't care if it's you're in, you know, a big rig driving to and from your pickups and deliveries or you're just driving home from your office to get to your family. We want everyone home safe every single day. How do we try and do that and how do we do it perhaps with a little more specifics around the freight world? Freight operations, truck parking is an example. We've been looking at various different ways to study and analyze where do we need more parking? Where are we okay? I don't think there's anywhere we're okay on full on parking. We always need more truck parking and where can we put that in? Where is it efficient? And where can we also include potential, you know, hydrogen fueling or uh, electric charging within these new truck parking areas? And clean transportation, working towards what we all want, working towards that cleaner future and also trying to help be more efficient in everything that we do in regards to freight within our state. So we've been through quite a bit in the last year, and I do have very exciting news in that as of last week, FHWA has approved our 2024 Colorado Freight Plan. So as of last week, we have a plan for four years that will give us money <laughs> uh, to be able to work with. So we preemptively started our next call for projects with all of our five regions a few weeks ago. So thankfully that passed, or it would have been a little bit awkward to tell that we didn't have the money. Um, but we've already got that underway because we want to try and deploy these funds as fast as possible to try and help some of these freight-motivated uh, projects. That, are there any questions? Thank you, Erica. Yes. <laughs> uh, Director Flynn, why don't we start with you? 
Why not? Thank you. Uh, if you know off the top of your head on slide 20, the commodity flow, I found I was curious about the difference uh, in about 65% of the balance on the value coming in versus going out. <clears throat> Excuse me, but the tonnage is basically the same. So is there some element about the commodities that leave, that are produced here that leave, that lends itself toward uh, customizing this freight plan? What are we sending out that's so cheap, in other words? Right? <laughs> As far as the Dr. Cog region, I don't know off the top of my head, to be honest with you. Um, I will say that we got our data through tra TransSearch. We purchased it. Um, downside is there's some contractual liabilities that we can't just send it out to everybody to be able to use. However, we're hoping to be able to create some form of online GIS to where we can dump all the data into, to which we can share and right. people can zoom in to have information like that be available. Okay, it just uh, the observation is pound for pound, the commodities that flow into the state are valued at 65% greater or 35% greater than the commodities we send. I'm just curious what that makes. If I were guessing, and this is just me guessing, more of the raw agriculture product versus something that's actually processed, manufactured, and brought in. Thank you, Director Hazeman, and then Director Mills. So in uh, my city of Golden, one of our priorities is public safety. And I'm looking at a couple of your charts where you talk about safety. And I'm curious about the liability of the trucking companies for incidents and accidents. Is that something that uh, you feel is properly placed, not on the driver, but on the, on the uh, owner and uh, the company? That's a bit of a case-by-case -case basis. Um, you know, Truck drivers go through CDL school. You like to think that they're all professional. Doesn't necessarily mean that they always act in a professional manner. There are instances where maybe the truck is not maintained in the way that it should. Drivers are required to do pre-trip inspections, so if something is wrong with, is, with the equipment, they should be able to catch it. Um, doesn't mean that they always do. You know, uh, when it comes to actual incidences, the liability ultimately gets pushed back on the company. The company holds the insurance, they're the one employing the driver. But again, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. Sometimes it's it's a case-by-case -case basis. I'm not sure if that answered your question or not. Thank you. Director Mills? Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. And I, I saw this presentation yesterday at the Regional Transportation Committee, and it, it got me to think, what are ways we can help lobby maybe the USDOT to require CDL drivers to have a more hands-on um, endorsement maybe on their license to know how to chain up, know how to drive the mountain passes appropriately? You know, Colorado's maybe a little unique, but we're not that unique in the in the West. Every state that touches the mountain and Pacific time zones have these challenges. And I know we're a state that has probably even more challenges than say, you know, New Mexico or something, but nonetheless, it affects the entire Western part of the U.S. And if we can somehow lobby the federal government to require some sort of an endorsement to help them have that hands-on training, because those that come from Florida, that 15 minute video on how to chain up does nothing. How can we effectively help them get that hands-on experience so they can actually handle the mountain passes, the chain up and wh whatever challenges that they're going through when they come here? I know that there have been a number of discussions about trying to have an endorsement for mountain passes, for mountain driving. Um, and forgive me, I'm drawing a blank on the group that has that power, but I do know that there really isn't much interest in adding more endorsements because of all the additional <laughs> things that go along with it. But trust me, that's something that there are a lot of different group groups trying to lobby and push for. I think the more voices, probably the better opportunity. Um, you know, speaking from past life experience, so my, my family owns a trucking company here. That's what I was raised in. That's what I was always around. And hiring, even in the state of Colorado, one of the requirements talking to these potential new candidates is, do you know how to chain up? Are you comfortable and have experience going over mountain passes? 
And the number of them that say, I refuse to change, that want to live and work in Colorado, blows me away. <laughs> so it's, it's something that I totally agree. I selfishly wish that there was more of a push within CDL schools to require it. These same people that refuse to change, do they refuse to also go through their logbook and everything that it takes to drive a commercial vehicle. I mean, I mean, there's a standard that needs to be met. If 92% of the people coming through and having these incidences are from out of state, what does that tell you? Driving out west. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to be effective here. <laughs> oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Director Odoricio and then Director Pakbaz. Can you guys hear me? All right, yeah. Um, so I, I'm, I'd like to kind of go deeper into uh, Director Flynn's question. If, as you get that data that kind of does the breakdown, kind of the drill down, I'm interested in a few different aspects of it. And so once you have that, will you let us know because, or if it's in the report? Of course, as Adams County, we're interested in understanding the Adams County specific piece of it, but also it, what are some of the other attributes to the data that we can expect to be able to see like what type oddities maybe where they're going or where where they're coming from or even like how they're being used because I think I could understand that this is also the metro area and a lot of it might be we might be consuming a lot of things we might be building a lot of things uh, but I also want to see if we could get a breakdown by jurisdiction absolutely and that again is our goal with trying to put that map together so we're hopeful to be able to make that happen sooner than later Akbaz? Thank you, Eric. Another wonderful presentation. Could you um, um, uh, uh, could you indicate where the freight plan could be located for folks that are interested going forward now that FHWA has approved that? Absolutely. So since we've gotten it officially approved, we now have to go through the ADA process in order for it to be accepted here within the state of Colorado with the new rules. So as soon as that is complete, we plan to upload it onto our freight website which is freight.colorado.gov, and it'll be under the planning page. Again, freight.colorado.gov. And we have three versions of this plan. So we have the hefty 325-page document that has all the details you could ever want. We also have a 52-page summarized version of the freight plan, so you can get more of a high-level less intensive, maybe not sleep for weeks after trying to read it version. And then we have a 10-page executive summary. So should you want to take a look at the 10-page and go, ooh, this is interesting, let me dive into it on the 52, ooh, let me get more details. For the long one, for instance, the economic section is over 100 pages in itself. So you can really get down and dirty if you really want to, uh, but we wanted to supply options for those who may or may not be interested in reading all that much. <laughs> Thank you. Directors Baker, then Martinez, and Mulvey. Thank you for your presentation, Eric. I saw it yesterday at RTC as well. Um, I need to ask if this freight plan, wherever in the 300-some pages, did they look at alternatives to our two um, north-south and east-west freight corridors? Um, and the possibility of looking at the Ports to Plains Alliance, Ports to Plains corridor that um, I think is important for us to consider, especially with freight, rather than adding more freight vehicles on our two busiest congested highways to consider an alternative. So first, I appreciate the question, and yes, the north, south, east, west is the primary route, especially if you're trying to go through our state, but we do have a number of alternative freight routes within our state. The freight network is pretty extensive. It just depends on where you're going. Um, as far as the Ports to Plains corridor that you're referencing, that is also a pretty heavily trafficked, especially for oversized equipment that may or may not be able to make it under or over certain bridges along I-25. Uh, what he's referencing is down towards the southeast corner coming up straight into the Lyman-ish area on I-70. The challenge with that is, to be totally honest with you, funding. With what we receive on this, it's roughly 18 to 20 million a year, which is great, but it really doesn't go very far. Um, so that, while I know is a big discussion in a lot of different groups, as far as what we can be able to put towards it, it would take decades for the freight branch to afford. 
Director Martinez. Thank you. Um, great presentation, a lot of great slides in here, but one of the ones that stuck out the most to me is slide 14, the cost of congestion per day. I was hoping you could share a little bit more information about what goes into the, those, those numbers. Um, how inclusive are these costs? So are you talking about the graphic itself on the right-hand side? Uh, yeah, my question is really about like, you know, what, what are the, how, how are you estimating these congestion costs per day? And, you know, what are all the factors that go into that? So that's some of the TransSearch data that I referenced earlier. So that's something that the federal government actually collects. So they have their own stipulations and things that they're looking at in specifics. I don't know what that is off the top of my head, so please forgive me. Um, I mean, I, I could assume just the amount of time times whatever their formula might look like for a truck in particular. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Director Mulvey? Yeah, thank you for this. Being kind of familiar with trucking myself and logistics, I appreciate it very much. Um, I wouldn't. One thing that strikes me is, yes, we're a consumable economy in Region 1 here, and the bottlenecks actually demonstrate to me why, because we consume those things. Um, and as you mentioned, the package process versus the outbound. And so I think that when we look at solutions, if this body were to look at solutions, we need to think about this economy and the people that live here need this stuff. And so how are you going to get it if you're not going to get it this way? Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you was really uh, granular but important to me because uh, my municipality is on the I-25 corridor. So slide number nine, I believe it was, or well, now I'm not so sure. It's the one that showed crash data. Um, so you had one that showed um, crash frequency, and I-25 didn't have a color, so we couldn't tell. So that one is five or less per vehicle mile track. Okay, okay. Kind of what that non-color color means. <laughs> so from that I'm taking, I thought that might have been it, I'm taking that it's safer for these for the semis, for lack of a better word, to travel on the interstate, and that interstate availability is quite valuable to our economy and to our safety. Am I drawing a, a logistically accurate conclusion? Oh, yes. Thank you. Director Ward. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I just have two questions. So the first one is, um, I know there's a group, and the group's name is not coming to my mind at the, at the moment, who, as we make the transition from internal combustion engines to uh, in particular, they are lobbying, particularly the federal government, to keep the um, max weight at 80,000. That could have implications as to how much uh, each truck is able to carry, which then impacts the number of trucks on the road. So I was curious if in this plan, um, CDOT had looked at different scenarios if the truck weight is kept the same versus increased, et cetera. Outside of our, so within the freight branch, we have our permitting for oversized, overweight, and hazmat. Um, that's about the extent that we went into. We did not look at it per se from a raising the weight for um, electric vehicles. You know, that gets really kind of, the water gets muddy as far as what we as a state have authority to do on our state highways. We can increase, but on interstates, that's Congress. Uh, there was, there's a bill last I heard that is allegedly being introduced uh, on the Hill in DC that could give states a little bit more autonomy to allow for certain instances uh, of emergencies to allow for higher weights of trucks on the road. Um, but not something we really dive into just because we don't necessarily have the authority to do so. But it is a genuine concern. If, if a battery electric truck weighs even just a couple thousand pounds more, you're cutting down a couple thousand pounds of payload, which then 
adds up over time, which is less efficient and more expensive for the consumer at the end of the day. So hoping there's a solution. Yeah, and it increases vehicle miles traveled, um, potential for crashes or incidents, et cetera. Um, the other question I had was this plan that we've been presented at least seems very focused on um, trucking. And my question is, as part of the 300 some odd pages, did we look at how we could maybe shift some of the commodities being shipped by truck onto uh, alternatives such as like rail, for example, um, knowing that a lot of the stuff that comes in has to go to a distribution center before going back out. Um, so I was just curious if that was something you guys had, had looked at. We're looking at trying to find efficient ways for them to work together. But at the end of the day, they're all private entities, private businesses. We can't really sign people to move certain freight commodities. But um, through our Freight Advisory Council, we do have a very strong contingent of both rail and trucking representatives. So there's a lot of discussions that may not have happened otherwise due to that kind of connection. So here's the hoping. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and Director Douglas. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Erica. You know, Commerce City is the logistic hubs for tri for train and tr truck traffic. And what is is CDOT working on the plans for a great separation? Because we have a lot of east-west traffic, 100, 120th, 112th, 104th um, highway. I mean, 96, 88th. We have a lot. And it is costly, too, to in order to do great separation. I, I understand that. And if you don't have an answer, that's, that's fine, too. I see that 90% of the vehicles come in. How many vehicles, how many trucks are actually registered in Colorado that leave and come back? Is that within this study as well? But I answer your first question as far as great separation. I believe majority of those are not on CDOT-owned roads. Forgive me. I'm incorrect on that. Um, I know that there have been a lot of discussions. Craig Hurst, who used to sit on this um, body, is my manager, and he talks quite a bit about it, very passionate. I'm also a Commerce City resident, um, so I know exactly what you're talking about, but something to discuss with the rail, because that's a very expensive, very tedious you know, solution. Um, you know, What are all other alternatives that maybe could be alternate routing for the vehicles? Are there other ways that we can try and get them around those rail crossings for when, you know, connected? So discussions, not solutions as of right now, but it's at least in conversation. Um, the second question is how many, 90% of vehicles come in, and how many vehicles go out and come in that are Colorado registered? I do not know the answer to that, to be honest with you. Um, Dirty laundry of the industry. A lot of even those that live here are not registered here. Um, it's business decisions that are more economically viable for the companies to register in other states that they have other headquarters or facilities in. So it's hard to really get a good idea of how many are even making local deliveries here that may not have a Colorado uh, tag. And the last question, when it comes to safety, and we have a lot of folks driving through our mountains who are not accustomed to our signs, are they also in different languages? Are you going to start doing like in Spanish or so? Because a lot of them are, are in English. Another discussions for the runaway truck ramps to add in Spanish. The challenge is Spanish is one of about 13 different languages that state patrol report back when they're talking to drivers on the side of the road unless we don't want the ability to see any of our beautiful mountains driving on I-70 due to signs in 13 different languages. I'm not sure that anybody can afford to be able to do that. Um, it is a challenge and a frustration because in order to get your CDL, you're required to know how to read and write in English. Right. Um, but you know, it's a challenge we're trying to figure out. And one of the beauties of the mountain rules campaign safety videos is we have it on YouTube, which then can be converted to any language that is out there. So our hope is that those that may not speak English or even Spanish can go on and listen to it in whatever other language that they may speak naturally um, to be able to have those tips and have a safer commute through our state. I appreciate that. Thank you. 
Thank you. Director Stolzman. Thank you very much. I want to thank you for the effort you put into this this afternoon. I have two questions. You showed us a slide on community input, and I wondered what pieces of community feedback you were able to incorporate into the plan. And then my second question is, I-270 is just such a critical corridor for us here in the Denver metro region. Can you tell us what you're doing to elevate the importance of addressing I-270? As far as the stakeholder input, uh, we have an entire section within the freight plan really monetizing the kind of overall summary and especially those that we heard repeatedly. Um, you know, something that we heard very commonly is fix our roads, there's too many potholes. Heard, understood, um, not the easiest thing just to up and solve. So, um, you know, we found those to be very important and a lot of Frankly, those discussions that we had with the community is what pushed us towards what data we pulled and really focused on. So things like this crash hotspots in front of us, something that likely we probably would have looked at anyway, but people concerned about the interactions of trucks and passenger vehicles in particular, okay, that much more emphasis needs to go into this data and make sure that we put that much more of a diagnostic kind of you know, analysis into the plan. And then, are your second question. 270. 270 has been something that's been discussed for many years. Um, I know within CDOT, within Colorado Motor Carriers Association that I sat on that board in a past life, and we had many uh, updates. I know that they are excited to try and push forward with that. They are in the environmental impact study step of that process. Um, which is a step in the right direction. Doesn't mean that everything's set in stone, depending on how that comes back, will help kind of give the direction of exactly what it's gonna look like. But it is something that there is more and more funding put towards and it's something that is a priority within CDOT and hopefully we can start seeing a little bit more progress visually for the rest of us soon. Thank you, Director Kelly, then Director Kelsey. Yes, hi, thanks for the presentation. Um, my question and what I was going to ask is, is there any data that shows the language of the individuals that come to Colorado um, passing the runaway ramps? I know we had a situation last time, the guy got 110 years, we all recall that. There was fatalities, he didn't speak English, he didn't read English, Run runaway ramp, flash, flash in yellow, pass it up. Is there any statistics that show like the majority of the languages that speak of the, the individuals getting in accidents? Colorado State Patrol typically does a pretty darn good job of collecting as much of that information as they can. That's how we heard through them how many languages that they do deal with. Whether they are collecting and using it as a statistic, I don't know that for a fact as far as volume of XYZ languages. Um, but it has been absolutely enough for us to take note and try and find ways to work around it because it's, it's a challenge. I mean, to my point earlier, you can't list out every language on every sign. It's just not something that's realistic. Um, but how do we find other ways to be able to communicate with them? Um, you know, uh, it's a tough thing to try and get, get through, and you hope that we can try and push out the materials that we do have that are available in other languages to help them. All right, thank you. Far as, far as, um, uh, Individuals learning how to put on the chains and whatnot like that, usually that's up to the employer. They, they're supposed to show the employees how to put the chains on. I've had my CDL for the last 13 years. I've never had to put my chains on, though, because I usually stay in the metro area for the United States Postal Service with my CDL. Um, but usually any other job that I've been to, they do show you how to put the chains on. Um, far as getting... Um, data far as what vehicles come in registered, that would take forever. You got way too many Freightliners companies out there, 10 roads, every, everyone coming in and out to distribution centers and whatnot, you'd never be able to get that data. It would take forever. So. I don't disagree. Thank you. And Director Kelsey? No, now I am. Um, I I know you're still working on this, and I'm hoping that the the Mountain Rules video and maybe the in cab communication can help push this. But I we have a, a chain up station right next to Georgetown, and in bad weather, we always observe 
truckers stopping not in the chain up area, they're stopping on the shoulder before the chain up area, which then it, it puts the driver, the passenger vehicles and the drivers of the, the trucks at risk. And I'm just wondering if how much effort there is being made to change that behavior. So to your four, first point of the in-cab communications, forgive me, I've given this speech a few times, so I don't believe I've touched on that within this group in particular. So one of the things within the technology piece um, that we're looking at heavily is an in-cab communication messaging system. So every truck that goes beyond 150 air miles is required to have an electronic logging device that's something that the federal government put into place in 2019. These basically are a way for us to track hours of service for drivers and you can't run two log books on paper. It's a way to try and get rid of a lot of bad actors that are very unsafe on the roads. So it makes it much safer. Through this technology, there is a, an ability for a system to be able to send out push alerts to these in-cab computers, basically. They're little tablets, typically, sometimes on cell phones, sometimes on various things, just mounted on the dash that can help communicate things to drivers. That's something we are very excited about, and we are trying to work forward, uh, forward into challenges, you know, how many notifications is too many notifications, too few notifications, but the idea, so for instance, just last week during the snowstorm, we were able to push out these messages to all of our bordering states, to every truck, and say, hey, I-70 is closed you can take another route, do it, please. Or if you can shut down now before you get into town where you have zero places to park because we're bogged down, do it, please. So we're really excited about that capability because then we can go into things such as the chain stations. Um, additionally, when it comes to that, there are potential options within um, kind of a new technology space that we're looking into that could use kind of radar, LIDAR type um, resources to see through snow and to be able to then tell the drivers behind, hey, there's a spot up here instead of lining up. If you are a driver that pulls in the very back of the very you know, end of a chain station, anyone behind you is going to assume it's because everything else is full. So why would you go on because you have nowhere else to go and you're potentially going to be cited for not having your chains on. So you pull over and put them on, which puts them into grave danger, the motoring public going by into great danger. Um, so we're very hopeful in some of those technologies as we do more research into them to see what we can implement within our state. Thank you. Uh, Director Pakbaz. Yeah, so if I could um, answer, help answer some of the questions that came up previously. Um, one on the signs, uh, a lot of our signs are, are determined by what's called the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, or the MUTCD, which determines how the sign should be done and has a um, kind of a standardized process um, nationwide. With that said, we uh, CDOT is trying to take a look at making signs more graphical in nature, so that way they're easier to read. And then I think there one other comment I would like to make is on the I-270. Uh, as Erica stated, there is a environmental impact study that is being done on that. And we do have on our website some open houses. I think the next one is April 17th at 5 p.m. at the Eagle Point Recreation Center um, to get public comment on that project. Thank you. Are there other questions for Erica? Yes, Director Douglas. So, I just have one more, and that is it would be much safer and less congestion as far as emissions if the big trucks were in the HOV lanes they would constantly keep moving. There's, I mean, that should be that should be an option. Because I'm thinking about E470. I mean, you, you know, they constantly move. So, I don't think I have the knowledge to answer that particular question. Um, you don't have to answer. Oh, okay. Yeah. I appreciate the feedback on that. I don't. There's some. Anytime we have our, as Erica stated, though, there's a lot of standards in, um, that are set by um, the federal government in regards to how the interstates are built, the lane width, the signs, and so forth. So I don't know the specifics on that. Um, however, on E470, if if the if a carrier wants to pay the toll, they're certainly able to use that on there. As far as the managed lanes, I'm not quite sure, unfortunately. Right. Well, E470 did a great job by lowering those prices 
during times of the day so trucks can get on them. Just that would be up for the E470 board. Uh, that's not something that um, we have control over. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Excellent job. Next is an action item, discussion on the based transportation planning program project selection recommendations. We have Nora Kern, Manager, Transportation Planning and Operations. Thank you, Nora. Da, 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 da. <laughs> All right, thank you. So my name is Nora Kern. I manage the sub area and project planning team here at Dr. Cog in the transportation planning division. And I'm here to talk about the project selection recommendations for one of our new um, transportation improvement set asides, and it's called the Community Based Transportation Planning Program. Oh, there we go. Um, so, just a quick uh, kind of background. Um, this program is uh, currently in the 2024 to 2027 Transportation Improvement Program. Um, however, we have actually been piloting our community based transportation planning program for the last year and a half. Um, we, the program is focused on providing technical assistance for member governments and community organizations across the region to support planning to improve mobility for historically marginalized and disproportionately impacted communities. So we have started off with a pilot. Like I said, we've been working with the city of Edgewater on a school transportation plan and have just kicked off a study in kind of a Westminster Adams County looking at microtransit services. Um, and so this program has since then been formalized and kind of set up as um, a set aside in the tip. Um, of note, this is one of our, our new format set aside. So there are four new set asides in the tip that are structured slightly differently than some of our past set asides. So the main difference is that these are set up such that Dr. Cog is retaining the funds ourselves and directly managing the projects. And so the idea behind this was to really alleviate some of the administrative burden that um, receiving tip money can have. Um, so for each of our set-aside programs, we have a single IGA that we're working on currently with CDOT um, so that we can manage procurement um, and kind of keep things moving and, and manage the IGA with CDOT. And then our stakeholder member governments um, and community organizations can kind of just participate as key stakeholders. So in the tip, there's two and a half million dollars for this program over the four years. So we are planning on splitting it um, into two two-year cycles. So we're talking today about the first two-year cycle, which is um, we're looking to spend around one and a quarter million dollars. So we have uh, had a selection process that we're now approaching the end of. Um, we started with the call for letters of interest in November and December of last year. Um, we had a pretty good feed, uh, turnout. We got 10 letters of interest received during that window. We had a couple follow-up conversations with some of the um, respondents. We then assembled a selection committee, which included a number of staff from the Dr. Cog Transportation Division. We had folks from the Regional Planning Division, as well as our Community Engagement Planner from the, um, community, uh, from the CAM Division. Um, we also had representatives from RTD and CDOT um, help score as well. So the selection um, panel did look at six different factors for each of the letters of interest um, that we received. Each proposal was scored individually by each um, member of the committee. We had some discussions um, and then have kind of compiled the scores to make our recommendation. So this uh, quickly is just a summary of the 10 letters of interest that we received. Um, we were pretty pleased with this response. It, we did have um, the a estimated budget um, as part of the letter of interest. And just a kind of quick note there, because these are just letters of interest, um, Dr. Cog is going to be developing the scope ourselves and doing procurement. So the estimated budget really is just an estimate at this point, um, but we did kind of get estimated budgets about twice the volume of available money. So we had about $2.5 million requested with one and a quarter million dollars available. 
So um, here on the next slide, you can see our recommendations. So we are recommending to move forward with five of the 10 projects that were submitted. Um, you can see there the um, draft budget, again, kind of tentative until we kind of get into the formal scope and figuring out exactly what's going to be needed for each of these studies. Um, and then there are five uh, projects that were not recommended um, due to budgetary constraints mostly at this time. So I'm happy to take any questions, but we do have a motion for you all today um, on the five recommended projects. Thank you. Are there questions for Nora? Director Flynn. Thank you. Thank you. Just a quick one. Uh, two and a half million dollars over two years, but in this first year we're allocating 1.35 million. That will leave 1.15 million. What are we anticipating for the next year based on the interest we had this year for 1.15? Yeah, that's a, a great question. A couple of pieces there. So it's actually over four years. So we'll um, be doing our next call for projects um, in summer 2025. So, um, but yeah, and excellent math there. So we have um, selected projects that are a little bit over what we were planning. So we had, like you said, um, we've been shooting for one and a quarter million. And so we are actually planning on potentially spending some of our planning funds to kind of help cover the gap to make sure we can do all five projects. Um, if that's necessary once we kind of get into that scoping piece. So we are anticipating the second two-year cycle that'll um, come out in 2025 will be around an, a one and a quarter once again. Thank you. I guess my math was good, but my calendar wasn't. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> that's <all> right. <laughs> Director Peck. Thank you. Um, I just want to mention as a great pairing with this program, that RTD has a partnership going on and Longmont has taken advantage of that um, in order to uh, control our own local transportation as our city is growing and RTD cannot get enough buses or drivers to go where we want to go. They gave us uh, in their partnership program dollars, uh, 400,000 over three years to have our own microtransit system, and we are putting out uh, RFPs right now. So um, I wish that this program was here when we started that application process, but if you are looking for your municipal transit to change it, um, I would suggest you look at this program as well as the Dr. Cog program. Put them together, more money the better. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Madam Chair, thank you very much. Seeing we're giving shout outs to our to our partners in crime. I also want to give a shout out to CDOT and thank them for as part of this program, they're providing the 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 um the match associated with this program. They're allowing us to use toll credits to do that. So we wanna thank you, Darius and everybody at CDOT for for that. That that helps relieve quite frankly, the cost for, for your local governments in, meet, in matching that federal money. So thank you. Other questions or a motion? Darker. Madam Chair, I move to approve funding five community-based planning projects for the first two years of the community-based planning program set aside as recommended by the selection committee. Director Kondo. Thank you. Uh, further is there further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it, the motion is adopted. Thank you. Next we have a discussion of state legislative issues. I imagine that's Rich Morrow. <laughs> Just go ahead and say a couple things while Rich is sure. into the. Yeah. As, as Rich is walking up to the podium, I just want to mention. So first, we're going to go over just give you an update on the status of some of these bills. We are just going to, Rich, if you may, if if you would, Rich. Sorry. But Rich, we'll just hit on Senate Bill 40, and maybe an update on 1313 if there's anything of any consequence to mention on that one. We're, also, if there's any other bills that you would like a status report on, obviously we'd, we'd, uh, we'd share that with you too. But uh, Senate Bill 40 is one, of course, that uh, we have a very strong interest in. So, Rich, go ahead. 
Okay, so Senate Bill 40 um, is still up in the air after all of our work and effort and um, from really all over the state, but uh, so many of you on, our, on the board and your communities as well. Um, we've been, as you know, pressuring the Joint Budget Committee to put $5 million increase in state funding for senior services. As of this point in time, they still have not done that. Um, and we expect that the long bill will be closed out tonight. So if they're going to do it, they're going to do it in the next <laughs> couple hours probably. So uh, it's pretty disappointing. But um, we still have Senate Bill 40 out there. Uh, we uh, have options that we, we actually need to discuss about if we want to still pursue, uh, a, say, a, a long bill floor amendment, which happens, or look at other opportunities to try to get some funding. Uh, but at this point, um, it's not looking that good. Uh, the uh, Senate Bill 40 is in the Appropriations Committee. It does have a, 40, a $5 million appropriation on it, but if the money's not in the long bill, then you got to find some other funding source for it. And that's not easy to do. <laughs> um, so, but there are other pieces of the bill that, as we've talked about before, that include um, an inflation adjustment and an evaluation process of the adequacy of state funding, which we already know the result of that study. <laughs> but, um, uh, but but they would be in statute for the state to to regularly evaluate how much it's funding for the triple A's and whether or not that's enough to really meet the needs out there. So so we're still going to be working on that. So that's kind of the update on that for right now. And then the next one you said was thirteen thirteen, Doug. If there's anything new or any consequence to report on that, I don't know if you or Jen have anything. Not from me, really. I will say that it is scheduled for a hearing in House Finance this coming Monday, March 25th. Um, but I did, Doug, I, I do want to give one little update on, on uh, Senate Bill 36, the road user or the vulnerable road user bill. It was killed yesterday. So it died, I think, in Senate finance. Yes. And I'm not sure why, but it's that that's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Rich, I can mention some of the potential amendments for 13. Oh, go ahead, real quick. Like. Yeah. So I know that a lot of local governments are meeting with the governor's staff and the um, sponsors of the legislation, and a couple of those top priorities that are uh, being communicated as a, for amendments. Uh, remove the HUTF, um, remove the DOLA injunction, reduce the minimums, um, and have more clarity and flexibility on um, other utilities other than just water, so that you also include stormwater, wastewater, um, power, other kind of infrastructure needs um, in order to re have to rezone for that, m that much capacity. So those are kind of the main amendment requests that have been submitted. Um, Rich did mention that the bill is going to be up in finance on Monday. I think if there's going to be any big policy changes to that bill, I think they're pushing it off to the Senate. So we could be waiting for a little bit until we get some major policy changes in that bill. Yep. You're welcome. So I think we're looking at bills uh, where we are considering. Right. We have five bills. All right. So the first one is an aging-related bill, uh, House Bill 1322, which would require uh, HICPUF, the Department of uh, Health Care Policy and Financing, to do a feasibility study of the possibility of having Medicaid work with uh, providers of services for uh, housing assistance and um, also nutrition and food assistance that typically aren't part of the Medicaid system, but that address this terminology that they have that we use these days, health-related social needs. 
um, and it's something that they could, if they decide that it's uh, it's a good idea to do that, they can apply for what's called a, a 1115 waiver that they that they would then apply to the federal government for. And the idea would be that if we get it approved, then we can combine state money with federal match to expand services uh, for, and it wouldn't just be older adults, it, it would be like the whole Medicaid system, but I've confirmed with the sponsor that it would also include uh, older adults, and that's something, that's the kind of thing that the Area Agency on Aging is, is looking into anyway. This is uh, the type of innovative funding approach that a lot of AAAs, including us, are looking at. So uh, we would like to uh, recommend a support position on that bill. Thank you. Uh, director, is it Ferret? Ferret? Ferret, close enough. Ferret? That's fine. Oh, good. Um, I, like that. I am wondering why we need to do a study. Why don't we just apply for it? I can't answer that question. <laughs> so can we? <laughs> the, the only thing that, that I will say that, that also, at the risk of bringing this up, I can't ask any follow -up, answer any follow-up questions, but is that the, 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 the bill also talks about it you know, doing the feasibility study to make sure that it that they can determine that doing this would be budget neutral, and which seems to me that that's kind of obvious that you wouldn't want to do it if it's not budget neutral. But um, that's that's just the way the bill set up. And I could interject. I think it's Colorado budget neutral. <laughs> not yeah. total budget neutral. Their federal input would not. That, yeah, that's right. Yeah, in other words, that we would be using funding that we already have and be able to present that to the federal government and then under Medicaid rules, they would match that money. So you're right, I, I, and maybe they just determined that they needed authorization to do that. Um, rather than just deciding on their own, but you know, this is money that we need, and it's something that they could just apply for rather than do a study, realize they need it, and then apply. It's just delaying it. So I would recommend that we just advise them to apply for it rather than do a study to decide to apply. I I'm happy to suggest that to Representative Brown. <laughs> Are there any, any other comments, questions for Rich? All right, staff is looking for a motion to support. Do we have a motion to support? Uh, so we would actually look for the abstentions. Are any of you required to abstain from this vote, or would you be abstaining? Oh, yes. Please raise your hand if you are abstaining. So uh, those in favor of a support position say aye, or please raise your hand. Looking for All right, those opposed say raise your hand. One. All right, so uh, the motion to support is adopted. Next one is uh, House Bill 1341. Uh, and actually, I, 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 for the next four, I think I'll introduce them and then call on my experts. <laughs> Uh, other staff to 
to address them, starting probably with drug Doug on each one. <laughs> Um, so Sanibel 31 or 1341 um, is uh, also an air quality related bill. And um, Doug, I think you're the one who told me to put it on the list. So yeah, I guess I should probably <laughs> at least mention it. Um, yes, to the degree that I know. So as as you know, I sit on the Regional Air Quality Council. I know this is a bill that they're running. Um, and basically, uh, in a nutshell, what this bill does, it allows local governments. To um, uh, to enact a uh, an idle restriction or an idling standard that is less than the current state standard. So the current state standard is uh, uh, that you can't idle a, a a vehicle for five five more than five minutes within any 60 minute period, and it just allows it gives local governments more discretion and flexibility to reduce that if they so desire. That's basically, in a nutshell, what the bill is. And oh, I should also mention that the uh, Colorado motor carriers are also in support. At least that's it's been relayed to me that 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 uh, that the Colorado motor carriers are in support. Are there questions about this? Staff is looking for a support position. Director Starker. Thank you, and maybe this is for uh, Director or uh, Rex. When I when I read it, maybe I'm just reading it or getting getting confused. But it looks like that local government could not pass an ordinance that made it more stringent than the state idling standard, but it can do one that is at least as stringent, but not less stringent than. So yes, state standard, the state standard, and uh, you can't go you, you can't, can't go more, you can't go less. Should be able to go less. Well, we know you you, you yeah. can be you can be stricter in the, yeah more more restrictive in in your standard, but you can't be less stricter than the state standard. Not be less stringent than the state standard, correct? Can't be more stringent than the state standard. It can be more stringent. You less stringent. <laughs> who's, and, who's on first? Uh, you know, yeah. I'm not sure who's you on first. You can decrease the minutes. You cannot increase the minutes of idling. Yeah. yeah. More stringent or equal. Thank you. Uh, uh, Josie, sorry. <laughs> Cockerel, sorry. <laughs> um, I see that there are certain situations that are called out. I'm wondering if this law would be applicable to school drop-off zones specifically. School drop-off yes. zones? I don't believe so, Rich, unless you know. Not, not to my knowledge. No, I think it's primarily motor carriers. Okay. Other questions? Sorry, Director Mulvey. Did you say it applies to motor carriers only? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure that the like the pound of truck, right? But I think it's 14,000 pounds and above or something like that. And do you know? I'm trying to find that in the bill and it's actually not written in the bill. Um, but I'd have to see what Article 14 covers in current statute. Yeah, okay. Different kind of, that's important to know. It's a different kind of regulation if it's regular people versus carriers. Oh, yes, Director Stolzman. Thank you. Boulder County is in favor of the bill. Um, it just, it, in case anyone wants to know, it exempts electric vehicles from the idling standard because they don't have emissions. <laughs> I, I thought someone might ask that. Um, so one, if, if you study where people have used this at the local level really effectively, it's been in like drive-throughs actually, um, working with land use and local zoning on drive-throughs and making sure people get through the queue in a way that's quick enough so they're not just sitting idling in the car um, cr contributing to emissions. And it's been quite successful in some cases where the local government has the authority because they can actually partner with the person um, and, and get something done. So we're supportive of having the local authority to be able to T to take action if you care to, and then it's not required if you're not interested. So we're in support. So, so if I'm understanding, like, would that be like a fast food drive-through or or a 
That's, that's one application we've found where people have been quite successful with using okay. it and measuring, like they've actually captured, like with those mobile emission monitors, like before and after, and worked with like making two lanes at a fast food restaurant right. instead of one and all the different things. And the partnership at the local level seems right to us because there are different circumstances that the state's not going to be able to get to that level and consider about land use planning and queuing and parking and all of those types of things. Great. Thank you. Uh, yes, Director Vidim. Hi, I'm back. <laughs> there uh, you are. <laughs> so an 18-wheeler sized truck pulls into a truck lot in uh, January. Can the driver leave his engine running so that he has heat sleeping in his truck? Basis uh, 1341. They're asking me a question for which I know the do not know the answer. <laughs> right at you, Ashley. It, it doesn't change the standard. It doesn't change what the standard is now. It depends. It, it depends. It's really complicated. It, if he's, it's he probably he or she is probably not idling. It depends on the truck. It, like it, it depends. He's he or she is probably not technically idling in the situation you described. Truck generation. But, Disregard my fourteen thousand pounds. I was thinking about a whole different thing. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yes. Go ahead, Director Spear. Thank you. Um, so I was just looking at the bill text um, on the ledge.colorado.gov website, and what it seems to be doing is just saying that local governments can implement um, regulations that are uh, more stringent than state idling standards if they want to. Is that Correct. Correct, because yes. that it, it seems like it's it's not really setting in place new things per se. It's just giving local governments control if they want to have a stricter standard. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Correct, Director Mulvey. I appreciate you highlighting that because that makes me think that this is more of a declaration because the municipality can do that anyway. But well, they can't unless this bill passes. They could know any. Oh, 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 we we got. Oh, we have we have clarification. Thank Hi. you. So this bill would apply to a commercial diesel vehicle with a gross vehicle weight rating of greater than fourteen thousand. And I was right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I didn't say that. Good day. <laughs> yeah, down your bingo card, huh? <laughs> yeah. Jen, restate that. That you were right. No, no. <laughs> I'll restate that. But no, do, wait, wait, just read it again. Yep. Commercial diesel vehicles with a gross vehicle weight rating of greater than 14,000 pounds that are designated to operate on highways and locations where commercial vehicle, excuse me, locations where commercial diesel vehicles load or unload if a local authority has adopted or enacted a resolution, ordinance, or other law consistent with this article. <laughs> Director Mulvey, that last sentence goes to my point of there's no prohibition under the existing statute doing this. Then would you agree with that? That that based on the last sentence, there is no prohibition for a, a municipality to do that today, that we don't need this law? No, there is a current prohibition. Oh, there is a pro prohibition. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, Director Spear. 
I was just going to re read the bill uh, one, one, more, one more time, uh, but it says current law imposes a uniform state idling standard on an owner or operator of a covered vehicle that prohibits the vehicle from idling for more than five minutes within any 60 minute period. So just wanted to, um, if, if you just Google the, um, the bill, you can find it right there, but it does state it right at the beginning as well. But thank you. Just wanted to back that up. So if municipalities would like this, um, freedom to do this, then we would vote in support of this bill. And to Director Sol Stolzman's point, um, sometimes communities know more about their community than the state does. <coughs> Excuse me. Other questions or is there a motion to support? I'll make some. Director Spear. Uh, move to support this bill. Second. And second by Director Ward. Uh, is there uh, further discussion? And we'll look for the abstentions to raise their hand, please. So we're for nine. Those in uh, everyone abstaining can put their hand down. Those in favor, please raise your hand and keep it raised. And we're looking for nine. Oh, so we. Needed more. Oh, 20. Oh, the reverse. Okay, but we but yeah, we had sufficient votes to uh, to pass this, so we will authorize staff to support this bill. So the next one is Senate Bill 165. Um, I guess another air quality related bill. Um, our staff has had uh, a number of thoughts about this bill and comments about it, but I would add, before you jump into it, uh, the bill was heard in committee today, a committee meeting that started a little bit before two and just finished a few minutes ago. Um, they did pass the bill, but it had like eight or, or more different amendments um, and significantly changed the bill. So I'm not sure, um, Ron or Doug, if, if we can even <laughs> speak to where the bill is right now. Should we? Yeah, I, I agree, but uh, Rich, I know this, this is one, there's been a lot of, there was a lot of proposed amendments that affect some of our, our comments that we have in here. Um, most notably, the reason that we took an interest in this bill is because there was a, um, I think it was in the section four of the bill, it specifically talked about um, CDOT developing VMT targets, VMT per capita targets, and we just had some concerns of how that have, what effect that would have on our, our regional uh, transportation planning, um, how it relates to, because we already, for example, we already have a Metrovision um, aspirational goal of 10% uh, reduction in VMT, and we also, we, we were, so we were, we were curious about, we wanted to have more conversation about that, but since we published this, that was a proposed amendment to remove that, uh, that's, that section related to uh, VMT targets and to re be replaced with, um, uh, uh, with information associated with um, our mobile source budget as it relates to the state implementation plan. And um, we, we have gotten some clarification on the, our, our first read was that we were really concerned that, the, that the, the proposed amendment was going to interfere with our federal requirements of, of, with uh, conformity determination and uh, development of our budgets for the state implementation plan for the, the, for the two ozone standards that are currently in play. Um, based on information we had this afternoon, it doesn't seem to suggest that, but we would like to still confirm that 
even if it did pass, we don't know if that amendment passed. It was L004. I don't know if that was one of the amendments that it passed. Did pass. That did pass. So at this point, um, Ron, I'm looking at you. I don't know if we had a recommendation on this, this bill or not. Um, but that was the main section that we had the most concern about. The other sections were related to primarily oil and gas related emissions. And, you know, that's not something historically we've taken up as a board. Um, but we do have some concerns about this section. We still want to get clarification. So, so is it appropriate to ask, um, continue to look for clarification and then bring this back to us next month? I mean, Ron, do you feel comfortable just in a monitor yeah. position on this? Yeah. With, you know, assuming we have discretion to yeah. work on it. Madam Chair, Doug, I, I think conferring with Jen, I guess the... Mic's on. Can you hear me now? Thank you. Is that on? I'm just a quiet talker, Doug. <laughs> I think the, the five amendments that were passed by committee today, I think, address most of the concerns that staff had with the bill. The issue is that it has only passed one committee. It still has a long way to go. I think our recommendation would be to take an amend position so that we can continue to make sure that some of those things that were amended out in committee don't come back into the bill as it winds its way through the process. Makes sense to try and take that amend position so that we don't have rules that conflict with our own or guidance that conflicts with what we're doing. Director Odoricio? Uh, if you're looking for a motion to amend, I would make that motion to amend right now based on the information shared on the record. Second. Thank you. Second from Director Starker. Uh, those who would uh, abstain, please raise your hand. So we need to ask those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, sorry, those uh, those opposed, please raise your hand. Great, we have sufficient votes to pass. Uh, please take an amend position. Appreciate it. One is uh, 24174. Yes, and this is the... Uh uh, strategic growth planning bill that um, was initiated um, by Colorado Municipal League last fall and was introduced recently. It is now scheduled for its first hearing next Tuesday. And um, I would imagine that, that many, if not most of you, have uh, heard about this or been in meetings about it. Um, I'm not sure how much detail we need to go into, um, but it does it does address some of the some of the elements that from Senate Bill 213 last year that were not controversial with uh, or not as controversial, um, but dealing with housing needs assessments and housing needs plans, uh, and it provides for uh, DOLA to develop templates for and do a statewide housing needs assessment to provide uh, elements for local assessments and regional assessments. Um, I've been in a couple of meetings, stakeholder meetings with uh, CML staff, and um, like a lot of these bills, they're still getting input and considering uh, possible amendments to be considered in, in the committee hearing on Tuesday. Um, but uh, it is planning to move forward. 
So staff is looking for a position of support with some amendments. Um, is there a discussion? Yes, Director Mulvey. I have a clarifying question. The last, sec the last sentence of the description says that HOAs are prohibited from, that the bill would prohibit an HOA from disallowing an ADU. Is that the way the bill reads? Am I reading that right? That's right. I can double check the, I can look at the bill itself at this moment, but this is part of the summary. Thank you. So to clarify further, the, a municipality could um, make the decision, but the, and, and could decide yes or no for a particular property, but the HOA would not be able to override that? That's my understanding. Director Starker. Rich, do you have a, an idea of what sort of amendments we would be looking for in the bill? Boy, not, not organized in my head. I got notes back there. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, from various meetings. Rich, let me just say this. I, you know, Director Starker, I think we're, you know, we're, um, we're supportive of the of the the framework of the bill itself. We always think that debt planning is a good thing to do, and I think we were supportive of you know the need for I think collectively as a body the need for how the regional or not even regional housing assessment, but housing assessments whether at the regional or local level. Um, it does have an extra requirement that uh, that requires local governments to do an action plan based on that assessment, which we also felt was reasonable. Um, our, our comments are primarily, they're pretty technical in nature. We just want to make sure that some of the data components of the bill that are requested are actually able to be, we can actually get them. And um, uh, so, you know, so that's why we're talking about these amendments. They're more technical in nature. The policy aspects of this from our, from staff's perspective, we feel pretty comfortable with. And Kirkmeyer and Zensing are very receptive to our suggestions. Well, we haven't had that conversation with them yet, but I, but I'm pretty sure you know CML staff is really working this bill, and um, so I think they would be open to those. Yes, Director Odoricio. Yeah, the, the Adams County is supportive of this bill. We we look at this as it's. It's very similar to what a lot of us in this room were supporting at the end of the year last year. Uh, with that in mind also, there may be some little tweaks. There might be some things that we feel, any one of us might feel are not 100% um, ideal. Uh, but if we don't support a bill like this, then it'll come back in a different way that you're not going to want. Uh, so I believe that this bill allows the level of, we believe this bill allows the level of flexibility and carrots and uh, at the right level, not a lot of sticks, meaning like we think this is the compromise and what it's doing is promoting more collaboration uh, and cooperation among the parties, which is what we were all asking for at the end of the year last year. And I'm afraid if we let the perfect be the enemy of the good on this one, I, I have the same opinion on the next bill as well, um, at least uh, uh, then, then you just got to be careful of when you keep pushing back, some of this stuff may come back uh, in, a, in a manner that you're going to like even more. So I would make the motion to support this bill with some uh, with amendments as described. Um, and would those of you who are going to abstain, please raise your hand. Can I make Oh, yeah. certainly. Yes, yes. Yeah. I'll try to be brief. Um, I, I can support. I can support the motion as it was presented. We're technically in an amend position, but that's fairly close. Some of the amendments we're seeking, like they, they we're we have some concern about um, to like if all of our agencies every six years do a housing plan and we do a regional housing plan together, is there really capacity in the planning industry to do all those plans? Like, or could we do some more coordination? Is the timing set? And so, so we have a real detailed list. We've that was working. discussed in the meeting today. That issue oh, was brought up. Yeah. yeah. So we have a whole list of amendments, but they're not. So, I mean, I can completely support this, but if you're interested in what we're seeking, I'm happy to share with you. 
right? Director Barr. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to say that the city of Littleton took a position last night to support the bill as well. Um, that was unanimous amongst the group. Um, I also had a comment at that time saying that the water supply component of the master planning process is so thin um, and is quite honestly, it's it's a bit of um, it's a bit of a backdoor to make an argument about water supply constraints that quite honestly shouldn't necessarily be involved in this kind of bill and this kind of process. Water resources management is taken care of by utilities, professionals, and many other divisions of our state and local agencies. And quite honestly, it feels as though it is going to ultimately be used in order to essentially sway housing development without the kind of full breadth of information that's required in water resources management. So I would suggest that maybe Dr. Cogstaff also, I'm going to support uh, the position, but I also just wanted to suggest to Dr. Cogstaff to really take a hard look at the water supply component of this. It's really unnecessary. Thank you. Other discussion before we vote? All right. Those who will be abstaining, please raise your hand. Those in favor of the uh, support position with amendments? And those opposed, please raise your hand. All right, thank you. The motion passes. We will support with amendments. And the last. Um, House Bill 1366. Um, how would I describe this? This is another planning bill, um, but with elements related to um, air quality and transportation and other aspects. This bill is uh, on the calendar for a little more than a week uh, from now for April, or yeah, April 2nd. And I'm really happy to be able to say April by now in the session. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair, if I may, I might just speak yeah. to some of the staff comments that are in, in this bill. Um, you know, the, the first comment that we have in there with regards to there was a uh, um, statement in there uh, about uh, having a description of any money from the federal government, state, or local government that has received uh, for planning purposes a goal planning. So it, 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 we just didn't feel that was necessary. But what I really wanted to speak to was the second comment that we had there related to the TDM corridor planning, um, which we think is a, it's, it's, it's a goal, right? It's a good goal to have to do TDM planning on, on, uh, on high growth corridors or limited growth corridors. But we, um, um, but it does reference uh, MPOs in that bill, of which Dr. Cog is an MPO. And if our involvement is sought for in this bill, is required for us to be involved, that we we just you know we we want to make sure that they're bringing funding to the table to be able to do that. Um, we, there's just so often, and we're seeing a lot more in in uh, in bills, uh, really in this session that. You know, we're seeing a lot of references to metropolitan planning organizations and regional uh, planning commissions and the work that we do, but there's, uh, it, it falls short on the funding side. We have specific funding for the work we do. We're a federal metropolitan planning organization, and we, our funding is dedicated to do that work. Any unfunded mandates, we just don't have the resources to be able to do it. So we just wanted to make a point of that. So... That looks more like. Um, yeah, so if you're asking. Straight amend? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it, it would be an amend position from us. Okay. Are there questions or discussion? Yes. Oh, I just. Oh, City of Aurora. Um, one of the concerns that we have over this bill is basically the infringement of home rule authority and also the imposition of the unfunded mandate 
which is preparing the climate action element. So we would recommend or would like to suggest a monitor position. All right. We have a motion in a second for monitor. Uh, and I second that. I didn't know who did the. Oh, I'll second. Multi. I think it was your motion. Was Actually, your we thought it was your I'm sorry. <laughs> right. If, if it was a motion. It's getting late. <laughs> if it was. <laughs> I, I still have some concerns about the, you know, the, the unfunded mandate to Dr. Cog. And as this body, um, I would hope we have another amendment <laughs> to uh, the motion. Director Stolzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, so I appreciate the motion to monitor. I do think we want the staff to work on some amendments. And so if we monitor, then the staff would just provide us an update at the next meeting. And I do think there are some things I'm hearing about the unfunded mandate component. Um, you know, you all are concerned about the climate action plan. We actually have a concern and are in an amend also because we think it makes us prepare additional climate action plans uh. and we have climate action plans. So we're trying to get an amendment so we can submit our climate action plan as the climate action plan and not create another plan. Um, so I, I think there are some amendments and, and I wonder if you would accept a friendly amendment to amend so the staff will work on some of those things. Getting the microphone. I would have to go back to the city and see if it would be amenable to that. So I would have to abstain from your your friendly amendment. So, I understand. So you're not accepting. That's totally fine. I understand. <laughs> Thank you. So if we were to vote on this and it were to fail as monitor, then we could vote to take an amend position. Um, uh, in essence. Mm -hmm. um, so if there is no further discussion, let's uh, find out who's going to abstain with a raised hand. So it takes 18 to take a monitor position. It would take 20, how many to fail? More than, so 18, it would, if yeah, if we don't get 18, <laughs> right, right, right. Yes, hello, thank you. <laughs> Those. Those in favor of a monitor position, please raise your hand. All right, so the motion to monitor fails, is lost. Um, is there a desire to make another motion on this, perhaps to amend? Director Starker. Madam Chair, I would make a motion to um, take an amend position on this one. Second. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Mauricio, uh, those taking an abstain position to amend, hands, yes, thank you. So we need 17 in favor to amend. Those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, the motion to amend passes. Staff has direction. 
And may I have a minute for two quick things? Certainly. Quick. Go um, ahead. One is, uh, thanks to uh, Director Kerr, he found some out some information rel relative to the vulnerable road user of bills, Senate Bill 36. Sponsor has told him that they're planning on reintroducing the bill. So I think maybe, um, Jen, you and me and Ed need to go talk to them tomorrow and find out what they got planned. That's it, unless you want to mention 184. Thank you very That's much. That's it. Thank you. Rich, thank you. And Jen, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, next are informational briefings, corridor planning pilot program update from Nora Kern. <laughs> on, on the laptop. There you go. Thank you. All right. Um, so next up, just wanted to talk about uh, another one of the programs in the sub area and project planning team. So this is our quarter planning program. And so I'm going to talk actually about the pilot version of this program, which has been going on now um, about a year. And so we're kind of in the um, second half of the pilot projects. Um, and then I can talk a little, just touch on at the end for next steps for the program overall. So this is a, a new program that we started um, in the last year or so. It's focused on um, advancing planning on the corridors that are identified in the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, so the, the projects and priorities that are specifically called out. So you, there's actually a map of all the, all the corridors that are identified. You can see there on the left. Um, and this program is really just focused on helping uh, member governments and the region really advance planning on some of these corridors that have been called out but maybe haven't had a lot of planning done yet or there's kind of a clear need for some, some regional planning to help move some of these projects forward. So we started this pro, um, program with a kind of an open call for um, letters of interest. So jurisdictions were able to nominate any, any corridor that is in the regional transportation plan. We, are, we were focused on only on arterial corridors, so not um, state highways, interstates, um, and then not local roads. So, just the arterial corridors. Um, the, the projects that were eligible included um, bus rapid transit corridors, transit corridors, safety corridors, um, and some of the, the other corridors identified, again, in the Long Range Plan. So I'm going to talk briefly about each of our two pilot, pro pilot programs. Um, the first is our Alameda corridor study. So um, both of these started last summer, so we're uh, almost three quarters of the way through. Um, the Alameda corridor was selected because it is identified in the 2030 to 2039 staging period in our plan at, for future bus rapid transit, but there hasn't really been any kind of regional planning looking at the corridor and preparing for that kind of potential future um, BRT. So we are looking from Wadsworth um, in Lakewood all the way through Denver out to um, Aurora in the R line. So we're working very closely with all the, the governments along the corridor as well as RTD and CDOT um, to kind of come up with a unified vision for the corridor and kind of a, a path forward to some of the priorities that we are outlining. So um, FHU and Nelson Nygaard are consultants on this project. Um, this uh, schedule is now a little out of date. I think I put this presentation together maybe three months ago, <laughs> but we have completed our existing conditions um, report. We had a first round of public engagement in the end of last year, looking at kind of goals and priorities. Um, we're actually in the middle of drafting concepts, and um, so I guess my arrow is pretty close. <laughs> and then we're planning a second round of public engagement towards the end of April and into May to kind of review our draft recommendations with the public and with our stakeholders. So we are shooting to have a final quarter plan in the summer. You can see here just some of the, the goals that have emerged on this corridor. Um, nothing too shocking, but looking at connectivity along and across the corridor, looking at safety, this corridor is on our high injury network, so that's a, a very important piece. 
improve transit, um, uh, again, looking ahead towards the potential for future BRT, um, accessibility, mobility for all users, and then vibrancy is really important. So Alameda is a, is a really rich cultural corridor for a lot of communities. We want to make sure we're supporting, enhancing, and kind of preserving all of the, the great communities along the corridor. So next uh, is the South Boulder Road corridor. So um, this corridor is identified in the Regional Transportation Plan actually in the 2040 to 2050 staging period for um, future transit improvements. Um, so the, we, are gonna be, we are looking at the study um, from a Broadway in Boulder where it's actually called Table Mesa Drive um, through Boulder County and then all the way out to 120th in Lafayette. And so again, you can see our project partners been working very closely with all the um, folks along the corridor, as well as RTD. Um, and schedule is somewhat similar. This, this arrow is a little out of place now. Um, we're our, we are working with um, each of the member jurisdictions to refine our recommended recommendations before taking those to public engagement. So we anticipate coming back to the public um, also in April to kind of make sure we're heading in the right track. Um, let's see, Ants here. Um, and then I just wanted to touch on, you know, this is a new program for Dr. Cog. And so we, it, it was intended as a pilot to kind of figure out, you know, this kind of new role. Dr. Cog hasn't been in this role in at least recent years um, where we are actually taking the lead on some planning efforts on some of these key regional corridors. So you can see some of the goals. Um, I think part of it's just internal processes, figuring out how to do this type of work, this type of procurement. Um, Figuring out, you know, I think in a lot of ways we've, it's felt very natural, just especially on these regional corridors where it's often difficult for any one jurisdiction to take the lead. Um, but also just, you know, there are some challenges with that as well. We aren't going to build anything at the end of the day, so we really need to work in lockstep with our um, partners and local governments to make sure the recommendations are resonating with everybody. And then last, I will just touch on um, next steps and kind of looking ahead. So similarly to the community-based transportation plan, the quarter planning program has been formalized as a tip set aside. It's one of those new format set asides where we are, again, retaining the funds um, and uh, helping manage procurement and project management um, while, of course, still working closely with the member governments. So um, there were $3 million in the tip um, set aside. We are splitting that to two two-year cycles. And um, if we have already selected the first two studies for the, um, the set-aside version of this program, which will be a Sheridan Boulevard safety study and an East Colfax BRT extension alternatives analysis. Um, both of those were in, in the kind of final stages of developing the scope and anticipate going to procurement in, in probably the next couple of weeks. Um, and then I'll just note that the second two-year cycle, we will have a call for projects again probably in the summer of 2025 to kind of pick the next round of quarters to look at. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Nora. Are there questions? Yes, Director Mills. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Did you say this includes bus rapid transit through these corridors, or is it just an overall global study? On Alameda, bus rapid transit is identified in the long range plan, so it's one of the elements we're looking at. But because this is kind of the first step study, we're looking at the full full vision of the study, so all modes um, as in addition to the transit. It's just the Alameda one, not on South Boulder Road. South Boulder Road is identified as a transit corridor, but not necessarily a bus rapid transit. So transit's an element, but it's looking kind of at the, the whole corridor. The reason I asked, there's already a study, to, or not just a study, but there's already a movement to bring bus rapid transit along Highway 7 from Boulder to Brighton. And I, don't, I hate to duplicate that, that effort there. Yeah, I think that's been a, a big topic. There's a number of parallel routes kind of in the Boulder County region moving kind of east to west. And so one of the big topics has been you know, each quarter might have a different purpose. Um, I think the South Boulder Road purpose, from what I'm learning, and, and many of you may know better, is a lot of it's about connecting Louisville to Lafayette. That's a really key connection. The downtown Louisville stretch is really important. And then connecting Lafayette to all the way to Boulder. So it might be a little bit more of like a local, um, you know, sub-regional corridor, whereas State Highway 7 um, is looking probably at, you know, higher capacity and a more substantial kind of longer regional connection. Thank you. Other questions for Nora? Right. Thank you very much. Great. Thank Excellent you. Excellent job.
Next, uh, Federal Greenhouse Gas Performance Measure Introduction. Alvin B. Sanchez is here, Manager, Transportation Plan. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, Directors. Uh, so my item today is a new federal performance measure that Dr. Cog and CDOT are subject to this year. Uh, before I get started, I do want to thank our CDOT partners. They've been phenomenal in all of our federal performance management efforts, not just this one that I'll be discussing with you today. I'm related to data sharing, coordination, giving us regular updates on where rules are, where their process is. So just a big kudos to our CDOT staff who are great partners in this. All right, there we go. So there are five performance areas that Dr. Cog is subject to. Uh, each of these fall into a different reporting piece, whether it's to Federal Highway Administration or the Federal Transit Administration. Each of these has its own data requirements, reporting requirements, methodologies. We're going to be discussing PM3 today, um, or at least a sub area of that. It's our most expansive performance area, um, colloquially known as the System Performance Freight and CMAC Performance Area. Like I said, it's the most expansive within this one performance area. There are four sub areas. We're going to be discussing what is currently called travel time reliability, but we can see about renaming that based on this new performance measure. Um, it is a new performance measure around the percent change in tailpipe CO2 emissions on the national highway system. So this will be a new measure for us and CDOT to take into account. The area that we're setting targets for and using data for is the interstate and non-interstate national highway system within our metropolitan planning organization boundary, so a subset of our regional roadway network, um, the full network you all are very familiar with, and it is just the mainline highways, so you're not looking at those on-ramps, off-ramps that are part of the network. The data we use, two pieces come from our federal partners, um, emissions factors, and then fuel cells data, and then that can combine with our vehicle miles traveled data. It is one performance measure, the percent change in on-road tailpipe CO2 emissions on the National Highway System relative to 2022. Um, that's a key piece, so we'll be basing that off of 2022 levels. The calculation looks a little confusing, but it's pretty simple. It's the emissions on the National Highway System in the current year minus the emissions on the National Highway System in the reference year, in this case 2022. Divide that by the emissions on the National Highway System in 2022 for the reference year. Multiply by 100 to make sure we get that percent change. So ultimately, when we come back before y'all, y'all will be, be, be seeing a percent value as a target. In terms of federal guidance, this one's a little new for us. Uh, these targets must be declining. So for the other performance areas that we do set, CDOT, Dr. Cog do have the option of um, supporting the states, setting targets that make sense for the region, but in this case, there is a new stipulation that these targets do have to be declining from that reference year. There's no financial penalty on Dr. Cog or CDOT. There's no funding restrictions. There are additional reporting requirements if we don't meet our target um, and some potential additional scrutiny into our planning process from our federal partners. I wanted to give you a visual of what this network looks like within our region. Like I mentioned, it is just the Metropolitan Planning Organization boundary of Dr. Cog, and it is just the dark blue non-interstate national highway system and interstate system within the region. So underlaid below all that is the full roadway network that we are all very familiar with within the region. Um, we are only talking about a subset of that network that we're going to be setting targets for and using data from. Dr. Cog, as an MPO, is required to establish targets 180 days after CDOT does. Ultimately, our deadline is September 25th of this year. We have to establish those through resolution. That's nothing new for this body. All of our targets are adopted by resolution. Like I mentioned, we can support the state's target or we can set our own, depending on what we think is best for us as a region. Um, an idea thrown out by our federal partners is we can use our share of the state's vehicle miles traveled as a proxy for our share of the emissions in the state. Coordination with CDOT is encouraged. We've been doing that since the rule officially um, passed. And then 
one key piece is there are no significant progress determinations. So at the end of our reporting period, Dr. Cog will not be um, scored checked to see whether we had met that target. Some considerations that we are just keeping in the back of our mind as Dr. Cog staff is that GHGs, GHG performance measures are nothing new for this region, nothing new to this body or staff. Um, it would just be a third version of uh, different metrics that we have in place. So we do have our Metro Vision measure. We also have the state's greenhouse gas planning standard, each of those looking at different data methodologies, um, different metrics. So this would be a third one that we could potentially align with some of our other processes that we have in place and that folk are familiar with. We've been briefing TAC, RTC, and now the board in February and March. Um, CDOT does have a deadline at the end of this month. Following that, our 180 days does begin, um, and we'll have that September 25th deadline. In between then and now, uh, we'll be coordinating with CDOT, getting additional data, coming back before y'all to determine what is the most appropriate direction we should take as, as a region, as a body for this new performance measure. That concludes my quick overview presentation. Happy to take any questions, Chair. And uh, staff from CDOT are also available uh, if there are any that I cannot answer or speak to their process. Thank you. Any questions for Alvin? Seeing none, thank you very much. Great job. Please note there are two informational items um, for your reading pleasure in your packet. And we're on to committee reports. First from the stack, Director Odoricio, please. Uh, yeah, um, I have my notes here. Uh, for the stack, it was my first stack meeting representing the group here. I want to thank everyone for sending Greg and I to represent you at the stack. Uh, at the stack, they discussed the and gave recommendation of approval for the final budget. Um, they did the overview and then talked about an update on winter maintenance and then had some updates on rest areas. I know that there's trying to do some reinvestments in some of the rest areas along the highways. And so if you have some questions, we can get you that more details. I will take a moment, though, to ask, follow up on the last presentation that we had. There's a lot of work that Dr. Cog does around greenhouse gases and some of these other, other topics. I think it behooves us to just keep making sure that we are notifying our legislators of the work that's being done. Because I think sometimes they don't always under, know or understand the work that is being done. And so they assume that maybe it's not being done. And so I would just ask that we kind of lean in and figure out how to be able to share some of the efforts like the presentation that we just had with our legislators um, so they don't feel like that there's gaping holes that they need to fill all the time with new legislation. And that might help us clarify some of those holes where we might need help. Um, yes, I took a moment of personal privilege to get that plug. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the report from Metro Mayors, Director Starker. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The uh, Metro Mayors have not met since our last meeting, so that will conclude my non-report. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, from uh, the MAC, I think uh, Director Teal, if he's on the line. He, he's not, but the MAC has not met since we last ah, met. All right, thank you. Uh, no report from the ACA. Report from Regional Air Quality Council. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much. Uh, just a couple items. We got a legislative update, primarily on the, the one bill that I talked to you about today, um, and then plans going forward for ozone modeling and control analyses. It's going to be another busy year for, for modeling and SIP development, so stay tuned. That's it, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, E-470, Director Mulvey. Uh, E-470 board heard presentations on the community engagement program and the status of that and the production of that, and also regarding Quebec Street interchange and the expansion of that to six lanes, and also an update on uh, finance from the finance department for 2023 numbers. Thank you so much. And CDOT, Director Pakba. Thank you, Chair. Um, one of the presentations took out one of the announcements, which is the freight plan was approved um, a couple of days ago. So um, in addition to the uh, presentation you had tonight, this uh, similar presentation was given to the Colorado Transportation Commission earlier today. Uh, the 
Commission also heard presentations on an overview of the greenhouse gas planning standard in preparation for some documents that will be brought forth to the Commission in later months. Other presentations included uh, an update on employee housing and also the final fiscal year 25 budget was reviewed, which will be up for adoption uh, tomorrow at the Transportation Commission meeting. And with that, that ends my report, Chair. Thank you very much. And uh, Director Welch, RTD. Thank you, Chair. Three quick things. Um, RTD is going to undertake some polling to get a sense of the electorate, electorate on a debrucing a attempt for RTD, our six tenths of a percent will no longer be will will be subject to Tabor once the T-Rex bonds are paid off, which is very soon. Second thing I'll mention is that we are going to do a 90-day pilot at three of our park and uh, stations: Nine Mile, Southmore, and Colorado, where we're going to keep the elevator doors open. You you might be aware of this, but we get hundreds of complaints about. Let, let's just say it's non-transit behavior uh, going on in our elevators. So we will do this for 90 days. Uh, we'll report back and let you know uh, if that's successful or not, but it's an area of trying to continue the improve the customer experience. And finally, we're one of six transit agencies in the United States that has been, uh, we're, we're part of the challenge to save lives from overdose. Uh, we have been in, actually in 2023, I, I was, surprised at the number of lives that RTD has, has been part of saving with Narcan and addressing overdose behavior that occurs on our system. So those are three things that I wanted to share with you tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Director Flynn? Just a quick question, Brian. Keeping the elevator doors open, does that allow them to operate? Yes. So, <laughs> yes, they still, oper they still operate. The difference is, is that the default is for the doors to be closed. And then, so in other words, if you approach our elevators, the doors are closed unless you push the button. Correct. What we're going to do is they're going to be open all the time. And you're going to have to, except, when, no except for when they're moving. <laughs> oh, close when I move. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> our, our next meeting is April 17th. And if there are no other matters, ah, yes, Chuck. Go ahead, go right ahead. Yes, this point Director of privilege, uh, would like to acknowledge the attendance of um, Northland's Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Shannon Lukeman Haramasa, who is my alternate, standing there waving. Thank you He's for also this executive long board meeting. member for CML. <laughs> Glad to have you. And uh, if there is nothing else. One more thing, Madam yes. Chair, if I may. Uh, if you need parking validation, Melinda has it. And don't forget to go out this door if you're in the parking garage, because if you go out here, you're going to get locked out because the <laughs> doors are locked. So just Thanks so much. 8.57 and we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.